Welcome back to the Pelvic Health Summit. I'm your host, Hannah Matlock, and this is our co-host, Dr. Allison Shrikande of Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine. Today we are here with two well-renowned surgeons, Dr. Mark Zoland, a general and laparoscopic surgeon specializing in minimally invasive and laparoscopic surgery, hernia surgery, and abdominal surgery, and Dr. Srino Brahm, an orthopedic hip surgeon and founder of the Hip Preservation and Groin Center. Thank you guys for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So I'm going to start with Dr. Zoland. What would be some common chief complaints or symptoms that patients would come to you with, with potential hernias? So oftentimes people are coming to me with pain that radiates around the groin area. Uh, and that's the area where essentially the leg meets the body. And that crease and above that crease is oftentimes where people are having pain. In males, the pain oftentimes radiates down into the testicle, uh, sometimes the skin of the scrotum, sometimes the inner thigh. Uh, depending on what type of hernia it is, that would generally give a more specific pain syndrome that certainly we can talk about. But uh, pain in that area, any pain below the umbilicus, which is the belly button, and down to the pubic bone, Oftentimes, certain syndromes that we see are really a lot of pain at the pubic bone or what people feel as bladder pain just behind the pubic bone and oftentimes is not, turns out not to be bladder, but it turns out to be uh, a missed hernia or a cult hernia as we call it. Uh, and then the pain down into the leg uh, would be from a different type of hernia that we see oftentimes. Great, thank you. Now, could you talk a little bit about the different types of hernia and sure. their correlation with pelvic pain. Sure. So uh, the first thing to talk about is the fact that on males, the hernia incidence is much higher than in females. However, uh, we are seeing that a lot of females do have hernias that are never diagnosed. And uh, it's probably a much higher incidence than is published. Right now, the percentages are 10 to 15% female, 85% male. but I do not believe that to be correct. Uh, the different types of hernias are inguinal hernia, femoral hernia, and obturator hernia that we deal with that do cause pelvic pain syndromes. The inguinal hernia is the most common in both people. Femoral hernias are coming uh, a distant behind that. And then the obturator hernias, which go down deep into the leg, uh, inner thigh, uh, those are not as common. However, we do see them. And Oftentimes, people who have chronic constipation or people who have pelvic floor dysfunction develop hernias because of the increased intra-abdominal pressure. And when you see those patients and they have symptoms that are similar to what we're discussing, one of the things that we do is an MRI to take a look for these hernias that are oftentimes missed on either physical exam or just not seen on the imaging that we've seen as of yet. Thank you very much. Now, Dr. Brahm, what would you say patients would come to you in terms of symptoms or chief complaints that could be related to their hip? Well, we see along for hip problems along the spectrum, anywhere from an adolescent age when they particularly engage in sport activities, because that's what brings on hip pain at, at that young age. But then it presents on later on, particularly about dull, achy pain, mostly activity-related pain. And these conditions after you can present actually with conditions that affect their daily activities even beyond sport activities. Those are, at that time when they start to get symptoms though, the, the hip joint's the largest joint in the body. And this is how this differs from other joints that we typically see in, in the field of orthopedics. And <clears throat> whereas they won't define a, a, a certain injury that happened, but something that they notice pain afterwards that developed after. Okay. And where is the pain usually located? Common areas for Great hip? Great question. I mean, the hip can be a nebulous area. And the problem with being on such a large surface area, there are other things that can either be hip pain or mimic hip pain. So that's where the challenge becomes for the patient, the practitioner, and the, the physician to know exactly where their symptoms are coming from. So it's important to understand about, A, communication with the patient about when they got their symptoms, where it is, when they get them, and then more importantly about their correlated with their exam. I see. And what would you think is the connection with patients who present to us with uh, pelvic pain symptoms, pain with sitting or pain with in, uh, erection ejaculation or intercourse, 
to their hip pathology. How do you think that get, is connected? Yes, I mean, just in proximity, location, anatomically, they're very close. And that correlation can affect, because in hip pain, with, with, when there's truly hip problems, it can manifest and then they get compensatory pain. And this is where we start to see the crossover of what we've seen before of pelvic pain and then pain with activity. Those are the things that when we look at where your symptoms are coming from, that's the key. I think that to understand about what, what's really bringing on their symptoms and, and then what is the underlying cause of it. Great, great. Yeah, so I've been fortunate enough to be able to work with both of you um, together on, on patient care. And so I know you two work closely together often for, with patients. How would you describe the correlation between hip pathology and potential hernia or pubalgia? Why does it come together often? Certain has to do with the type of patient that comes in that, that Dr. Zola and I will see together. The most common is somebody involved in athletics um, because then that goes back to compensatory pain patterns that happen. But there is a cross that happens when you have coinciding with the hip pathology and groin. And if they have, and particularly in the hip, there's some subtle structure abnormalities that can predispose patients to this. Those same conditions can also predispose to patients for groin and pelvic pain. Great. And to add, generally, the, the nerve uh, distribution for the hip and the nerve distribution for the inguinal area or the groin area are overlapping. So oftentimes it's a little bit of a struggle if we have a complicated patient and we're not sure if it's a hip related problem or if it's a groin related problem based upon the soft tissues around the hip. Three of the nerves completely overlap and then there are two nerves in addition on either part of the uh, body that we're talking about. But ultimately the imaging study is important Oftentimes we have to get diagnostic studies like a hip joint injection to see if that makes the pain go away. Then you start thinking it's more hip. You can do injections into the nerves that cover specifically the groin. If the pain goes away, then it's more likely groin. But we oftentimes have to tease out what the pain syndrome is coming from. Most of the time we can. Sometimes it's pretty tough. It's a, it's a high uh, traveled area, so. Mm -hmm. Great, and now that we're on that um, the nerve distribution. I know there is a new procedure that you recently went to Europe to learn. Would you like to expand on that procedure sure. and discuss it a bit? Sure. Um, in, in dealing with the groin pain, one of the things that has manifested is that uh, groin pain is not always confined to the groin area. Sometimes it's also uh, expanded into the pelvic floor area. Uh, or vice versa, the pelvic floor pain can expand into the groin area. And 30% uh, of the time, the nerve distribution in patients is a little bit different. And that, again, makes it challenging. But one of the things that we've been seeing is that the pudendal nerve, which I'm sure in other uh, segments that's come up, uh, might be the nerve that is most affected with pelvic floor pain and certain times with groin pain. And uh, there is a procedure in Europe that releases a ligament that we believe is uh, either compressing or tethering the pudendal nerve, or it relieves the uh, compression on the vessels, the pudendal artery and vein. And in either case, you can easily have a pain syndrome from either of those. So if there is compression on those structures and we're working hard to figure out the best diagnostic testing to do to get that answer, uh, the maneuver of releasing that ligament uh, has been having some very good success in Europe right now. It's not being done in America that we know of, um, and it is a laparoscopic approach. And the goal would be to A, figure out if it truly is helping, and B, if it is, figure out a safe way to be able to do it and a consistent way to do it. Um, Dr. Zolan, when you're treating patients with hernias, what other specialists are usually involved? Most of the time, it, it really depends on uh, who the patient is sent in by. Uh, I get patients coming in from uh, pelvic floor specialists, but also uh, orthopedic surgeons, gynecologists, uh, other general surgeons who are not sure of where the pain syndrome is coming from. Uh, usually these are patients who they've had multiple consultations from prior doctors and uh, they have not figured out where the problem lies. And 
Certainly I can't figure it out all the time either, but, but we do have some um, tricks, let's say, uh, up, up our sleeves in terms of figuring out where the pain comes from, which is a little bit more in depth. Uh, the, the testing that we usually use is an MRI for two reasons. One, we try not to give people radiation with a CT scan, but also the MRI actually gives us a lot of information. It looks a little bit at the hip, and it, in, the, in the type that we do, but it also looks at the soft tissues around the hip and the soft tissues of the groin and, and the pelvic floor. So it gives us information, for example, like an obturator hernia, which might be something that is not seen on any other test, but will be seen on this test and could be giving somebody pain into the leg that we can delineate and ultimately we can fix surgically. Um, other maneuvers that we do are nerve blocks and uh, other diagnostic tests that are helpful in the clinical exam. Uh, but mostly patients are coming from urologists, gynecologists, orthopedic surgeons, and other general surgeons. They're usually not coming from the internist because by this point, the internist has not figured out which direction to send them. And ultimately, they bounce around a little bit sometimes first. Right. Thank you. And Dr. Brom, when you're treating hip pain, what other specialists do you work with? Well, just like Dr. Zoll, my patient population typically comes from other providers. So I get it uh, most commonly from my other colleagues, orthopedic surgeons, um, just due to the nature of the, my specialty, um, pelvic floor specialists, uh, physical therapists, and um, <clears throat> other rehab physicians. Um, the most important thing, though, is helping them, helping their patients actually sort out their, their, their pain and, and giving them a diagnosis. Um, sometimes the conditions that I treat actually show up on imaging, and then though that's not really their problem, and then I can help them in that way too to exclude that it's not really coming from your hip. So we help them in both in both ways. And Dr. Brown, why would you say it's important to treat any hip pathology um, to diagnose and treat it early? Yes, because the the most common conditions are usually from structural abnormalities. And sometimes these processes can lead to further breakdown of the actual articular cartilage and lead to eventually arthritis of the hip. But it's not only just that too. Um, what we see that when patients start to have hip problems, it's not only just the pain, they start to manifest in compensatory patterns. They also start to manifest in lack of motion. And that lack of mobility, that motion goes somewhere else, either to the pelvis or to the lumbar spine, and then they start to get disorders elsewhere. And this is where then it leads to affecting their daily activities. Okay. And can you describe the surgery that you would perform if someone had a labral tear with an impingement syndrome? How, how is that surgery performed? Well, the good thing about it is that we do it minimally invasive called hip arthroscopy. And that, first of all, allows us to do the procedure through a camera and without opening up the hip joint or cutting through muscles. And the advantage of that, besides being minimally invasive, is also the recovery time they go home that day. Um, and this allows them to start to carry out their daily function while they're recovering from their hip. And it's also important though to, to understand about what the proper indication for that procedure. And right now we're coming on our 10-year data of analyzing that. And even though this is a new procedure for, for our field, it's, uh, we've been doing a lot of research on this. And this just giving not only the patient short-term data on the procedure, but long-term too as well. Great. And Dr. Zoland, why is it important to uh, diagnose and treat hernias early? So when we have patients with pain syndromes and we're not clear as to where the pain is coming from, one of the things that we like to do is treat the hernias surgically and fix them. Uh, and that's for really several reasons. One is uh, if the hernia is the actual pain syndrome, we've solved the pain syndrome. If the hernia is not the primary pain generator, but it is involved with pelvic floor dysfunction or some orthopedic problem or urologic problem, oftentimes fixing the hernia will have a symbiotic effect on the rest of the process. Because the hernias are essentially an opening where something is going into the opening, and that can cause either some pain on the nerves or it can cause a mechanical dysfunction. And that has consequences down the road. So, Ultimately, we like to fix the hernias if we can in these patients because it helps the overall situation. Um, normally, the way we would fix them, depending on what the actual problem is, is laparoscopic, similar to Dr. Brahms, 
surgery and, and the laparoscopic approach, the minimally invasive approach is you know, nice for the patient. There's, there's not a large incision, there's not a long downtime, uh, but also the, the risk of the surgery, hernia surgery laparoscopically is fairly low. And uh, if you have a situation where you're not sure the chicken or the egg, the thing that's the primary pain generator, it's not a big issue. I mean, it's still surgery, there are still risks. Obviously, these are important conversations to have with the patients, but oftentimes you can fix the hernias, get a good result out of it. It's a low risk procedure and hopefully that'll solve the problem or at least help solve the rest of the problems. So I'm going to ask both Dr. Zoland and Dr. Baram, what percentage of patients that you see do you operate on? That's a great question. What I tell my patients is my waiting room is filled with patients with label tears and not everyone walks out with a surgical plan. And it's a small number. Most patients that we treat and see for consultation do not require surgery. And the good thing about with, with the hip conditions is that there are alternatives to do between um, physical therapy, rehab, injections, and alternatives before a surgical option. And the patients that you do not operate on, where do they end up? Where, where would they go? If surgery was not required, where would you send them? To other specialists, whether it's a, a pelvic floor specialist or a physical therapist that specializes in hips, because these are patients that require special attention. And so it's not just that consultation, we have to give that, continue that level of care even outside of their consultation. And sometimes though, it involves a collaboratory effect where I'll have a patient that I may have you see, or Dr. Zolan see, and there's certain instances where we may even operate together on certain patients because it may require that combined where we offer the patients that say that, look, this is a condition that we can either see how either one procedure that we can address both problems, or sometimes it may require additional procedures with that. Great. And Dr. Zoland, what percentage of patients do you operate on? Right, well, I, I definitely think that uh, I see more patients than I operate upon. Um, I would guess my percentage is a little bit higher than Dr. Baram's, only because most people are sent to me already with known hernias. And the thing about the hernia, it's a little bit different than orthopedic uh, conditions in that the hernia won't go away. You can't yoga it away. You cannot um, physical therapy it away. It, it's a physical defect in the abdominal wall that just is there and either you live with it, which sometimes is absolutely fine. Not everybody that has a hernia needs an operation. Um, and sometimes you fix it. But the difference is oftentimes orthopedic conditions can get better. Hernias don't get better on their own. They either stay the same or get worse. Um, so oftentimes we, we can give to the patient the option of leaving it alone, live with you know, uh, the pain from it, but you're not living with any danger hanging over your head. Um, there are certain hernias where you have to operate regardless of the symptoms. If there's bowel that goes into the opening, if there's an organ that goes into the opening, we don't like to leave that, even if it's not causing any pain, because that represents a potential harm to the patient. Um, but I definitely, Oftentimes we'll see patients who uh, the, the, the worry is that of a hernia or athletic pubalgia or something to that effect, and on the imaging and on the clinical, they don't have that. And then ultimately, you know, the nice part about coming to all of us who really specialize in this, you of course included, is that we generally have the next step for you. It's not just to listen, you don't have this, I don't know what to do with you. Um, we have seen, and again, you being one of the primary movers in this, so many people with these issues that we've developed a large network, as Dr. Barama said, of people who really specialize in this. So if we don't think it falls within our realm, we oftentimes, if not always, have a next option for you, which is nice. Are we always right about the next option? Of course not. But but we, we at least try and keep the ball moving towards a direction of figuring out what's going on. And when patients are looking for a hernia specialist, are there certain questions they should ask or how would you suggest that they go about finding the right doctor? Right, so certainly general surgeons are trained in, in hernia surgery. So um, it, it's absolutely not that I feel that anybody that has a hernia has to come to me or somebody that only deals with hernias like I do. Um, however, it's the diagnosing part that's a little bit difficult sometimes. 
the, the testing that is done is not a universally accepted type of test. Um, and that's the MRI where we have a very specific protocol. Uh, and then even when the protocol is done in, in some of the radiology places throughout the country, they don't read the scan the way we would normally read it necessarily. And part of that is a definitional problem. They don't define hernias the way we define them sometimes. Uh, but also, it may just be that the radiologist looking at it is not clued into the fact that this is specifically what they're looking for because they have a whole scan to look at. They've got 100 different things to look at, and the hernias are probably the least important on their minds, although, of course, on our minds, it's one of the most important. So ultimately, a lot of times it's about the diagnosis, who's making the diagnosis. Uh, but from the uh, surgery perspective, inguinal hernias are very common and inguinal hernias are commonly fixed by general surgeons. However, femoral hernias and obturator hernias are not as frequently fixed by general surgeons. Sometimes general surgeons wouldn't even know how to fix an obturator hernia. And that goes to the training and it goes to the fact that there's been this um, migration of open surgery towards laparoscopic surgery and laparoscopic is what has uh, opened up this area of obturator hernias and femoral hernias to us. And some of the surgeons to date are not really trained in laparoscopic surgery. So the main point is that if you're meeting general surgeons who are saying to you, you don't have a hernia, but they're not looking at the scans, or they don't do laparoscopic surgery, or they're just not listening to what you're telling them, and you know something's wrong, but they're not finding it with you, go, you know, kick it up a notch. Go to the next level of surgeon that specializes only in this area, because sometimes that's helpful and that answers the question. That's really helpful, thank you. And Dr. Brom, similarly with you, when patients are looking for a hip doctor, are there any recommendations that you have that they should be looking for specifically? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, within orthopedics, um, you can break hip treatment of hip surgery, either from hip preservation, which I do, or um, total hip replacement. And sometimes though, it gets confusing to the patient that if they go see uh, an orthopedic surgeon who does a high volume of total joint replacements, um, they may not be so helpful for them if it's the problem, it's not hip osteoarthritis or there's conditions that can be treated without a joint replacement. And that's the value of what we now call hip preservation. And what would one word of advice be that you could give to everyone listening in regard to hip pain, if they know they have hip pain or think they may have it and they're not exactly sure or they wanna start the process of figuring this out? It's always good not to ignore your symptoms. And I learned that from my patients. And they, they, the ones that realize that, okay, you know what, I should listen to my hip, that's the best guide. And once they do that, I think it's appropriate at least to get to a healthcare provider that can help sort, start the process for them and get that process where it may involve appropriate imaging. And that's just like what Dr. Zolan said though, um, sometimes though the imaging can be misleading and then put the patient in a different path. So it's important to get to a specialist that understands not only for that specialist though, but for also the, a multidisciplinary approach. And that's the advantages that we use because being here in Manhattan, I have the advantages to work with great physicians right here in this room. And then also colleagues of ours that Dr. Zoll and I share are radiologists who are experienced in this, either doing the appropriate imaging or reading outside scans. Thank you. And Dr. Zolan, what is a word of advice that you could give for the audience as well in terms of diagnosing hernias? I think that, um, and not just hernias, but any, any pain process that the patient has, uh, and let's say they're working with doctors and they just feel like the doctors are not uh, focusing on what the patient is telling them or the doctor just seems to be missing it. If you feel that way, start advocating for yourself and find the doctors who seem to be more in tune with the symptoms that you have. What's amazing today is that you can get on the internet, and I know all doctors oftentimes say to patients, don't go on the internet. I actually feel the opposite. I think the internet is a phenomenal resource for patients, especially if patients are not getting the answers that they seek. So my advice is advocate for yourselves because uh, if you go on the internet and you find people who have been in your position, 
they will lead you, these people, these other patients will lead you in the correct direction oftentimes. And it, it, it actually saves a lot of sort of alternate pathways that, you know, so for example, here's just a perfect example, you know, somebody goes to their internist and it doesn't happen all the time. I'm not saying don't go to your internist, but somebody goes to their internist and they have, you know, what they think is a, a groin pain problem that they, they know in their heart of hearts it's different than all the groin pain problems that they've had in the past. They've played soccer or lacrosse or whatever it is and they know what a groin injury is and it goes away and they know that. But they have something different this time and they go to their internist and their internist says, don't worry about it, it's just a groin pull, leave it be. So six months go by and the pain doesn't go away and then the internist says, okay, maybe we should have you see an orthopedic surgeon and the orthopedic surgeon says, eh, you know, it's probably some early hip stuff don't worry about it, do physical therapy and the pain doesn't go away. And now you're a year into it. And ultimately the goal is to not waste that time if there really is a problem that you feel something is not going in the direction that you, know, you think it should. Most times it does go in that appropriate direction, but if it doesn't, that's when you start to have to think about, okay, what, how do I advocate for myself here? Because you know, it's not going in the direction that it really should be going. I think that's great advice, thank you. And I know from being a patient who has had various forms of pelvic pain, I've often seen doctors who haven't necessarily, not, I don't wanna say given the, not given me the answer I, I wanted to hear, but I knew something different was happening than what they were diagnosing me with. And that's when you realize it's time to move on to a different doctor and get another opinion because at the end of the day, you know your body the best. Um, but thank you both for your wonderful answers. And for everyone listening, where can you be contacted? Um, well, I'm, you can just look my name up on the internet. Um, I presume it'll be found, but I'm here in Manhattan. Um, our office is going to be, we're opening up an office on 133 East 58th Street. Um, and certainly, you know, I get, um, imaging studies from patients who send them to me all the time. I'm happy to take a look at studies for them if they feel like the imaging is being done and, and it's not being read correctly. Uh, but, you know, the office number, in case you need it, is 212-628-8771. Thank you. Yeah, my office location primarily is on the Upper East Side here in Manhattan. We also have a, a location on centrally Manhattan in Columbus Circle and also a satellite office in North Jersey. Um, but we're also very accessible through um, contact, the, having patients contact us through, the, through our website. Um, and also to, for just to, even before they come in for a consultation, if they want us to review over their imaging too, we have that service for them too as well. Thank you both for being here and sharing your expertise and really informing everyone on the relationship between hip problems and hernias and pelvic pain. Thank you. Right. Thank you for You're having welcome. us. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. If you can relate to this video, please leave a comment below and share it with anyone else who you think may benefit. Thank you. Mm -hmm.